Without further ado, Ward Straubey. It's about close enough to how we said. Okay. Um, he's going to tell us whether space-time must be singular. OK, well, thanks. Thanks for having me here. Um, indeed, this is a talk about space-time singularities and about space-time singularities in quantum gravity. So as you know, in the classical theory for gravity, in Einstein's theory for gravity, space-time singularities like a Big Bang, these are generic. And, it's usually, and this is usually taken as a signal uh, that the theory must break down at some point. Or it signals that the theory uh, is not so complete. And the hope is that with a quantum theory for gravity, uh, these space-time singularities will be eliminated. And as you can imagine, that's going to depend whether this happens or not is going to depend on the approach to quantum mechanics. Or, sorry, the approach to quantum gravity. And last time I checked, there were 22 mentioned on Wikipedia, 22 approaches to quantum gravity. I'm not discussing them all here. I'm just going to restrict my attention to two of the main ones, which are really the width, uh, quantum gravity and loop quantum gravity. Okay. And there has been some... Recently, there had been a, a series of very interesting papers by Ashtakar and others. And this, these claim to show that in really the width quantization, you have singularities for large class of states. And in loop quantum gravity, there's uh, no singularities for large class of states. So, and these people take it as an argument in favor of loop quantum gravity and against uh, 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 really the width quantization. Okay. What I'm going to do in this talk is look at this problem of singularities from the point of view of uh, Bohmian quantum gravity. Okay? And the reason to do that is that these analyses by uh, Ashtakar and others, well, they use standard quantum mechanics and there's still some conceptual problems with quantum gravity in the context of standard quantum mechanics. Okay? And Bohmian quantum gravity is able to solve <coughs> these conceptual problems. And I'm going to see what comes out with uh, the question of singularities. And the result is going to be that in the really the width quantization, there may or may not be singularities. It depends on the wave function and on the initial configuration. And in loop quantum gravity, there is no singularities for, for any states. Okay. You mean in a Bohmian version of loop quantum? Yeah. Okay. So let me first start with this really the width theory. What is it? Well, very schematically, well, it's when you just use the usual quantization uh, uh, recipes that were so successful in high energy physics, the quantizing mill series, you just apply and do, do GR. Okay. Just the most conservative thing you can do. So what you do is you go first, you, 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 you write down general relativity in a Hamiltonian framework, so you introduce the space-time splitting. You write it as a dynamics for our three geometry, okay? So there's a three geometry evolving along the leaves of the foliation, and then you quantize that. Okay. What you end up with is wave functions that are functions of a three metric, okay, of a spatial metric, and there's a certain wave equation for that, and that's the really the width equation, and it looks like that. So the time derivative of psi is given by some Hamiltonian acting on psi. But in addition, this Hamiltonian acting on psi has to be zero. That comes from this quantization recipe. So instead of giving you some dynamics for psi, it just basically tells you that well, psi is in time independent, and it just has to satisfy this constraint. There's also an additional constraint here, which I don't mention. In loop quantum gravity, it's also a quantization recipe. It's a different one. It gets different results. What you end up with in this quantization recipe is uh, states are states, which states are functionals of loops or, or holonomies. Uh, okay, and you get a similar kind of type of equation that the Ham Hamiltonian acting on psi is zero. Okay. There, there are some problems with both of them. There's some technical problems. Uh, making sense of these equations, finding solutions, okay? For that reason, people often consider uh, simplified models, these so-called uh, uh, mini superspace models, where you assume certain uh, 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 
uh, asymmetries like homogeneity and isotropy. But in addition to these technical <coughs> problems, uh, there's these uh, conceptual problems. And the first is just a measurement problem, which carries over from quantum mechanics. Okay. So for people that don't know the measurement problem, what is it? Well, in non relativistic quantum mechanics, you have two possible evolutions for the wave function. On the one hand, there's Schrodinger's evolution. On the other hand, there's collapse of the wave function. And when do these evolutions to take, take place? Well, according to his te textbook on quantum mechanics, collapse takes place if you make a measurement. But this is kind of vague, okay? What exactly is a measurement? Do you need a measurement device? Or do you need humans uh, looking at the system? Or do you need humans with a PhD? So as long as you don't make that precise, you can't regard the theory as, as a fundamental theory of nature, okay? So you have this, because you're still in the quantum paradigm with Wheeler de Witt quantization or loop quantization, you still have this problem. And in a sense, it's even more severe because why well, you want to describe the whole universe, even though maybe with uh, simplified models, but still you want to describe the whole universe so there is no outside observer or uh, measurement device. The second conceptual problem is, is the problem of time. So you see, these, these, these wave equations, they say that the wave function doesn't depend on time. Okay. So how can we tell from such an equation whether the universe is expanding or contracting or whether we might run into a singularity or not? Okay. And third is the problem, what, what actually do you mean by a singularity? Okay. So in the standard quantum paradigm, you just basically have the wave function. So there is no actual metric. So there's, there's no immediate space time here. There's just wave functions on three metrics. So, so what does it mean to have a singularity or space time singularity? And so in the literature, you will find different notions of that. So, and some of these you can find is uh, <coughs> that the wave function, so what, what does it mean to have a singularity? That maybe the wave function has a support on singular metrics or the wave function is peaked on singular metrics or the expectation value of the metric operator, that is similar. Okay. I find neither of these uh, definitions very satisfactory. Okay. For example, the last one, you take an expectation value, so what exactly does it mean? Does it mean that like, if you take an ensemble of universes, then on average you don't have a singularity? Does it say something not about one individual universe, our universe, does our universe then run into singularity or not? And it also seems to me that if you're, if you're worried about singularities, you should, when singularities usually appear when your equation of motion breaks down. You have some stuff that evolves according to equations of motion. If that stuff cannot be evolved further beyond a certain point, you have a singularity. So here, if the stuff is just a wave function, the only worry you can, in principle, have is that the, the wave function evolution is not well-defined at a certain point. So the, the, the Bowman approach to quantum gravity, well, this, this solves these conceptual problems, okay? What, what, what is this Bowman approach? Well, in this Bowman approach, say for the wheeler witt theory, there's gonna be an actual metric in addition to the wave function, okay? In non relativistic Bowman mechanics, according to non relativistic Bowman mechanics, the world is made out of particles, tables, chairs, everything is made out of particles, actual point particles moving in space. And the way they move is determined by the usual wave function. And the usual wave function then never collapses in this theory. Okay? So that's why there is no measurement problem. When it comes to quantum gravity, you're going to have an actual metric now, an actual three-dimensional metric, a spatial metric that evolves in time. Okay? And the way it evolves in time depends on the wave function. And you can see that even though the wave function is static, so the wave function doesn't de depend on time, you might still have a non-zero velocity. And generically, you will have a non-zero velocity. And that's going to give you a non-trivial dynamics for the actual metric. How do we understand the, the T in the Well, if you want to do it for full quantum gravity, you have to somehow pick a foliation. And there's going to be a time bringing you from one leaf to the other. 
you could reparameterize the time, but the foliation has to be fixed. So it might have been a different, it, it might identify at the same T that we would a relational time, you mean? Yeah, yeah exactly. It's going to be relational time, uh, and you're going to, it's it's going to be it very. It should be an arbitrary parameter. But yeah, exactly, parameter. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it solves the problem of time because you can have an unfold with trivial dynamics for the metric, even though the wave function is static. There is no measurement problem because the wave function never collapses, so there's no ambiguity when it would collapse. And the meaning of singularity is also now unambiguous here because you have a singularity whenever this metric is singular. Okay, you just have the same definition as in classical jar. And also you would see from the equation of motion, if I wrote them down explicitly, you would see that ah, this, this equation of motion breaks down whenever this metric has the usual singularities. Okay. Before I go to these singularities, let me make some publicity for some other work I've done using Bohmian quantum gravity. <coughs> so one of these things is uh, looking at cosmological uh, fluctuations. And there's two errors in cosmology where these fluctuations play an important role. Uh, in initially, at the beginning of the universe, described by inflation theory, and in the late universe. Uh, and in the early universe, uh, according to inflation theory, all structures like galaxies you see there they're supposed to come out of vacuum fluctuations. Okay? And these vacuum fluctuations then also leave an imprint on the microwave background. But the problem is these vacuum fluctuations are described by a homogeneous state, okay? a homogeneous wave function. So how do these homogene homogeneities come about from this homogeneic state? Okay? According to standard quantum mechanics, some collapse must have occurred. Okay, when did this collapse occur in the early universe? It's unclear. Okay. So Daniel has written a lot of papers on that, uh, stressing this point that there's a problem here. In the Bowman theory, there's more than just a wave function. There's also an actual field. And this, this actual field is going to carry the inhomogeneities. Okay. So this is how it solves that problem here. Another problem is in the late universe, there's a worry by some people that there's going to be Boltzmann brains popping up, okay? And these are disembodied brains that arise as spontaneous fluctuations. Okay? I won't go into the details here, but in, in the Bowman approach, this, these Boltzmann brains wouldn't appear, okay? Or the chance is extremely low that they would appear. Because according to the Bowman theory, if you have a vacuum state, it's not a fluctuating soup. Actually, everything stays static. And then a third, uh, a third application is actually a practical application. Because qu quantum gravity is so hard, people usually do semi-classical approximations. That means treat gravity classically. And then you have a, what people usually do is take an expectation value for the energy momentum tensor to, that, to take that as a source term in the classical Einstein field equations. But this is going to lead to problems if you have a sup microscopic superposition of matter being here and be being there, for example. But now, using Bohmian ideas, you could actually replace this expectation value by an actual Bohmian energy momentum tensor. So it's going to be an actual matter distribution, going to be an actual energy momentum tensor being here or here in the case of the superposition. And potentially, you might have a better theory here. Okay? So this is some work in progress. So now, to the singularities back. So yeah, I, it's not the essence of my talk, right? Maybe. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, so, back to space time singularities now. So, let me first go through classical mini superspace. What is it about? Well, I assume a metric of this form, a Friedman Robertson Lamarette Walker metric. Okay. So, the only degree of freedom here is the scale factor, okay, which depends on time, and so it just tells you how the universe is expanding or contracting. Okay. So this is a homogeneous and isotropic metric, and then there's also matter, and it's homogeneous. So it's basically constant over space, and it just changes over time in this field. Here I have chosen actually a particular time coordinate. Usually there's also laps here in front, which is arbitrary, which makes that the time is, uh, which makes that the theory is 
a time reparameterization invariant. I didn't include it in explicitly just for the sake of notation. Okay. Uh, this this time here, it's actually the time for uh, an observer. It's the proper time for an observer moving with the expansion of the universe. Okay. So that's going to be the time also relevant to study singularities. So. And there's going to be a singularity whenever this uh, scale factor is zero. So. Well, you can see from this expression here, then you don't have a Lorentzian metric anymore. And also from the equations of motion, so, well, first of all, I introduce, as in Karim's talk, A is uh, the exponential of uh, alpha. Okay, so A is bounded, it's, it's, it's positive. If you introduce this alpha, alpha goes all, all from minus infinity to plus infinity, okay? So there is no longer a bound on alpha. And the singularity, when A is zero, and the scale factor is zero, that corresponds to alpha being minus infinity. Okay. So you see you have singularities here. Whenever alpha goes to minus infinity, you divide by zero here. So the, the classical equations of motion break down at singularity. And so these are the classical equations of motion. So you can see if this C is zero, uh, sorry, yeah, if, if the C is zero, then alpha and phi are static. Okay. And then you're basically led to Minkowski space time. So in that case, that's a special case, there's no singularity there. Because apart from this special case, there's also always a big bang or a big crunch. So this is displayed here, so this is A, this is T. You either start like this and expand forever, or you have the time reversed, you just uh, go down to a big crunch. If you would plot the trajectories in alpha phi space, which we're going to do a lot. So these are just these straight lines. Okay. Remember alpha going to minus infinity? That's a singularity. So like this trajectory, if you go this way, you end up with a big crunch, okay? If you go all the way down to infinity. Or you can have a time reversed that you start from the big bang and you keep expanding. And, and similarly for these trajectories. So the wheeler witt theory, if you quantize this theory according to the wheeler witt rules, well, this is, uh, this is the equation you get, just a two-dimensional Klein-Gordon equation, so simple to, to analyze. The, sol the solutions are superpositions of uh, psi r and psi l. So psi r are these, just these functions, psi l are these functions. So you can, that's the translation of this packet all the way like this. <coughs> And that packet you translate all the way like that. Okay. In the Bohm theory, there's an actual metric of this form again. Okay, there's an actual scalar field. Okay, just the dynamics is not the classical dynamics. Its dynamics is now given by it's, it's determined by the wave function. So, if I write my wave function as an amplitude times a phase factor, my velocities are basically proportional to the gradient of the phase. Inside the Bohmian theory, there's an actual metric like that, but we're talking about a three metric in the Bohmian theory, right? Is, is it right, well, A, we determine this three metric here. Yeah. But the other part? Um, well, because <laughs> well, the other part is not affected. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, here again, so an important thing is I uh, dropped the lapse function. I could have used it all the way here, also in the equation of motion, and that would just make explicit that this theory is time reparameterization invariant. So just as in the classical case, this theory is time reparameterization invariant, I just basically gauge the time here, I choose a particular time here. If the wave function is real, then this phase is zero. Okay. So that means that again, alpha and phi are static. So in that case, you don't have singularities. You just have again Minkowski space time, everything is static. There's no singularities there. Okay. But this is not what we want, right? Uh, there, the general class of solutions that has no singularity at all is of this form, of this special form. Okay. Uh, 
it is the real part, well, sorry, sorry, it's the amplitude of psi r plus the amplitude of psi l with a relative phase factor, okay, with a constant phase factor. Okay. These are the only wave functions that don't give singularities. For example, if you choose this special form for psi r and psi l, you're going to have uh, cyclic universes. Okay. If you just look at psi r, say a wave function like that, then for this wave function you have a big bang, so you have trajectories like that. If you look at psi l, say of this form, then you have a big crunch. If you just have psi r, psi l, you always, every trajectory is going to be singular. Um, if you then have a superposition li like of this form, then there's some trajectories that are going to be non-singular. So these trajectories are going to be with a big bang and then big crunch. So remember alpha to minus infinity, that's the singularity. And there's going to be some trajectories with no singularities. So, uh, these are going to be bouncing universes. Large universes that contract to a minimal point and then expand again. Okay, so you can have all types of solutions here. Okay. And in the end, of course, you want to see this was without uh, cosmological constant, without matter potentials. Of course, in the end, you have to see for realistic potentials, do you have solutions that at late times correspond to what we see nowadays in the universe, like uh, an approximately classically expanding universe or not? Ah, a, a remark now, so this, this theory was time reparameterization invariant, so that means that this particular time coordinate I chose, t, that's, that's not an observable quantity, okay? But you can, of course, construct clocks uh, in this theory, right? And uh, conceptually, what you would be doing is, like, take some other degrees of freedom, like this matter of degree of freedom here, and that's the only thing you have now. If phi is monotonic in time, Okay, you could use this as a clock variable. Okay, you could express the evolution of the other degrees of freedom, like the scale factor, in terms of this phi. Okay, so that, that's how you would model a clock and model other degrees of freedom, how they evolve with respect to that clock. And this should be contrasted with what, what is usually done. What's usually done is well, one of these coordinates is picked out basically by hand to serve as, as a clock. Okay. So what's often done is like uh, the scalar field is treated from the start like as a, as, a, as a clock variable. And then like the square root is taken, so you get something like an ordinary Schrodinger equation, where phi now plays the role as a clock, and then this equation is analyzed. Okay. And what I've sometimes seen is that, well, what's the motivation to take phi as a clock, and for example, not alpha? Because remember, you had the two-dimensional time Gordon equation, and phi and alpha basically played played the, the same role, right? So it was a perfect symmetry in this case between alpha and phi. And what I've sometimes seen is that the reason that phi is taken as a clock is that uh, classically it is a mon monotonic function of time. But that seems to be a strange motivation to take this phi as time because what has the classical world to do with the quantum world? Why should some classical property have some effect on how we interpret this variable in the quantum case? So that's a puzzle for me. Now, loop quantum cosmology. So that's actually the application of these loop quantization techniques to uh, mini superspace models. You, you end up with something different from really the width theory. Because now your wave function is going to depend on the scale factor in a certain way. But it's, the scale factor is going to take discrete values. So well, instead of A, now the, the notation nu is introduced, and nu is basically corresponds to the volume, so A cubed. There's a, a proportionality constant C here, which is not important. And also nu can take neg negative values. Okay? This is also not so important. That's, uh, that follows from the quantization recipe of uh, loop quantum gravity. So the important thing is here now, your, your, your wave function is function still of the scalar field and of this discrete variable nu. So this volume becomes discrete, or the scale factor becomes discrete. 
as it creates in this sense, so there's, it takes multi multiple times uh, for lambda, and lambda is just some constant. You end up with a wave equation like this. So here you have, again, the second order derivative with respect to phi of this uh, wave function. There's a function here, b. In the related width theory, this b would just be 1 over a cubed. Now it's like a regularized uh, function. For large, for large a or for large nu, this goes to the really the width value. But for small nu, instead of going singular, like 1 over a cubed, it goes to 0. Okay, so that's one important thing. That's one <coughs> important difference with the really the width here. And also, this kinetic part for the gravitational uh, part of the, of the real derivative equation becomes discrete. So it becomes a difference operator instead of a differential operator. Okay? It contains sums of psi at different values of mu. Okay? There's some other properties here that this uh, wave equation satisfies. These b's are real. These k's are also real. And I haven't made these functions explicit because as usual, there's operator ordering ambiguities, and like different operator orders have been considered. Okay. In the Bonin theory, then, what happens is, well, again, there's an actual metric, okay, and there's an actual scalar field. Okay. But now the dynamics is going to be stochastic, so the scalar field, before it evolves continuously, okay, deterministically. Now it's going to be stochastically. So the scale factor is only going to take discrete values. So what's going to happen in this Bohmian theory is that this the scale factor might make jumps. So it might have one value at an instant, and then at a certain random later time, it ha might have another value. So the expansion of the universe, say, will go in discrete steps. So if you have expansion, it will go like that. And the technique to, to do such a Bohmian model that was already given by Bell, he had a model for quantum field theory where you had like fermions on a lattice, and in his model you had a number of fermions on each lattice points, and these numbers change stochastically. Okay. So the equation for phi here in this case, it's still of the same form as before, just a bit of a different notation now, and there's certain transition amplitudes for the scale factor to jump from one value to the other. Okay. Yeah. Why there's no way of having a continuous uh, Bowman? Yeah, 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 and it follows from the discreteness of the Hamiltonian uh, of the wave equation, basically, because you don't have a differential equation; you have a different equation. Okay, it's most natural to go with a discrete Bohmian version. Okay. So the wave function is only defined in certain values of a. So it's natural for also the Bohmian variable to only be defined on those values. Right. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm nearly finished. So I have these transition amplitudes here, but there's some ambiguity in these transition amplitudes, these jump probabilities, but you take the minimal jump process. So there's, of course, you can introduce extra noise so that there's more jumps, but you just choose the minimal amount of jumps uh, necessary. And then you can just look uh, well, whether or not you might jump from a non-singular metric to a singular metric, or vice versa, if you jump from a singular metric to a non-singular metric. So that would correspond to a big crunch or a big bang. And then just this list of properties I gave you for the wave equation and for the wave function just imply that ah, there's never the probability to jump from non-zero scale factor to zero scale factor. So to have a big crunch, that's zero, and vice versa. You, you never have a big bang either. So there's never a jump from a zero scale factor to a non-zero scale factor. Okay. And this is regardless of the state you have. So in a sense, this is kind of a nice result because it's, it's stronger than what P 
people in Lucan gravity can derive because they usually consider special states, for example, states that are at late times approximately classically. Okay. So I had to make none of these assumptions. Okay. So that's the conclusion now. So if you look at a Bohmian version of Willy DeWitt theory and loop quantum gravity, in the Willy DeWitt theory, there may or may not be singularities. Okay. Depends on the wave function, the initial metric, an initial uh, scalar field. For loop quantum gravity, there is never singularities. There's still lots of questions, of course. Well, the main ones are, like, in loop quantum gravity, what, what do typical universes look like? We believe that, in this, at least in this simple model, you typically have a bounce. Okay. So I guess this is going to be the same in the Bowman theory, that typically you have a bounce. But I haven't been able to show that explicitly yet. I haven't looked so much into detail in that. And of course, it's only mini superspace. Right? I don't know what will happen in more advanced models. It would be nice to check, and maybe there's also a simple argument that shows, okay, there's never going to be singularities. Thank you. Well, I think we have some comments from um, oh, Donald first. And then I will, I'll take hands when, when after the comments. So, not surprisingly, Many of you have already anticipated some of the questions I want to ask, but we'll get a chance to, to investigate it in a bit more detail. So I think, I think Ward is the first in this meeting to seriously investigate a Bohmian, De Broglie-inspired interpretation of quantum gravity. And I'd like to thank the organizers and Ward for having given, given me the opportunity to revisit a formalism with which I had been only superficially familiar. So Ward's motivation was to avoid the quantum mechanical measurement collapse scenario in the Bohmian fashion, solve the so-called problem of time, and to check whether singularities would be avoided. Uh, and I will have a final comment regarding my own, own attitude towards the, uh, the time problem uh, toward the end. So uh, first of all, I have three questions. Um, the first, as I understand it, uh, Ward's principal innovation is a technique for extending a pilot wave formalism uh, to a loop quantum gravitational treatment of what has become a standard toy model, uh, a massless <coughs> scalar field source of a homogeneous and isotropic friedman robson walker cosmology. The fundamental demand is that some version of the Hamiltonian constraint acting on the wave function is required to vanish, uh, whereas the phase of the wave determines the continuous evolution in time of the scale factor and massless field in the conventional Wheeler-DeWitt equation in Ward's loop approach, the evolution of the metric variable follows a discrete stochastic evolution in a given time interval. And as he just mentioned, the idea was apparently borrowed from Bell's original proposal for introducing particle creation and annihilation in quantum field theory. Uh, and uh, I wonder, as I guess many of us in the audience wonder, whether there's some underlying physical rationale for supposing such a process in this apparently distinct context. So whether there's a physical rationale or not, well, so for example, when it comes to quantum field, so what I said was like, Bell was the first to develop this for quantum field here on the lattice. The next, there was like a continuum version of that developed by Drew Goldstein and others. And that is a continuum version of quantum field theory. And that's more in the spirit of what I've shown here, because there you have trajectories, continuous trajectories, and then suddenly particles may be created or annihilated. And that's also a stochastic process, okay? And that's for now seems to be the only way how, to, how we can account for particle creation and annihilation, okay? There seems to be some stochasticity coming out there, okay? Yeah. Okay, uh, well, well it, it's maybe natural to think that, that there may be some link maybe to the sort of atomistic notation that Daniela was describing to us. Right. Yesterday, is that, yeah. you can go yeah. and carry that further. And, and, the, and the thing is that while you reproduce the predictions of, if you consider a regularized quantum field theory, if you introduce a Bohmian dynamics in this way, using your stochasticity, you're guaranteed that you get the usual results, okay? Mm -hmm. okay. okay. And that's what you want in this case. In the case of quantum gravity, of course, you don't, you have no clue what the quantum theory for gravity is, and so 
the wave equation is just a guess, the Boolean dynamics in the end is also just a guess. Okay, right. okay. good. So my, um, my second question uh, is, of course, related to the first. Um, both the stochastic processes and the lack of a normalizable wave function, which you have not, you hadn't, didn't mention in this talk, uh, seem to preclude the probability interpretation that was a cornerstone of Bohm's original non-relativistic interpretation. So is there some sense in which one can really conceive of an undisturbed pilot-type wave evolution? And can one say anything about the nature and interpretation of, of the choice of an initial wave ensemble? Right, yeah. Well, that, that's an excellent question. So I haven't addressed this here. Indeed, these wave functions you consider here, if you were to try to normalize them with respect to alpha and phi, that, that's impossible. Okay? So that's also part of the reason why people in loop quantum gravity, for example, take phi as a time variable from the start, and then they construct a Hilbert space, and then they have normalizable wave functions okay, with respect to phi. If you want to get out probabilities, in, but if you want to get out probabilities in this case, there's some work that needs to be done. Okay? Yeah. The Bohmian dynamics as it is now, it preserves actually the density psi squared. Okay? Psi squared is an in invariant, determines an invariant measure. It's normalizable nonetheless. But if you no. then look at, oh. at actual solutions, you can construct an actual clock variable, then you would be able to start analyzing actual probabilities. And then using this psi squared measure, which is not normalizable, you can get to normalizable probabilities. Uh, oh. But uh, it is not, yeah. Okay. In, in simple cases, it's easy to do. In more complicated cases, yeah, you have to do some work. Uh, okay. And that's being developed right now, actually. Okay, yeah. good, very good. So uh, a related third question. So um, I wonder about the robustness of the singularity avoidance result. Uh, you have explicitly treated four cases uh, in the accompanying paper, and uh, that result from factor ordering ambiguities in the original constraint. Um, and there will be many more possibilities. Um, so um, I, I guess you anticipate, are you, are you <coughs> convinced, in fact, that the, that the non-singularity -sing avoidance is a robust result? Well, I, I have no idea, really. Uh, from what I've seen from other simplified models, mini and midi superspace models, I think singularity is also avoided in the same way as, as here. But for general loop quantum gravity, I have no, I have no idea. Okay. I'm not even sure how the boom inversion would work in that case. Uh, okay. Okay. Good. Now, if you'll permit me a final comment. So, so first of all, I want to claim that the problem of time results from a misunderstanding of and conflation of two distinct operations in canonical gravity namely symmetry and time evolution. And furthermore, it can be shown that phase space variables can be selected that intrinsically define a temporal coordinate with respect to which variables evolve. In fact, and this is the key point here, there exists an infinitude of legitimate choices that one gets through these canonical transformations. And for each one of which there is a distinct Hamiltonian constraint, and for each one of which one retains the full uh, diffeomorphism covariance. So I'm now even talking about the larger uh, generic context. So there are distinct Hamiltonian constraints and distinct corresponding Wheeler-DeWitt equations. So that, that amplifies this, this, uh, uh, this flexibility problem that one has in the treatment of the Hamiltonian constraint. Mm -hmm. So to, 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 to my mind, that would uh, make even more suspicious these results concern, concerning a singularity and avoidance. So you would say on the, on the, even on the just quantum level, on the level of the wave equation, there's ambiguity? So even on the level of the wave equation, there's ambiguity. Mm -hmm. It's true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, like, like this first question concerning quantum field, well, there's actually not that much choice, right? Uh, that are reasonable. There's like, there's, there's a, a difference between treatment of bosons and fermions, for example, right? We only know how to do it with point particles for fermions and with, with actual fields for bosons. So, but for, for like bosons, we just know how to do it with fields. So there's, that's the only way we can do it. For fermions, there I know two choices, like the Raxi picture, or the picture I just described, where you have particle creation and annihilation, but that, that's it. Uh, mm -hmm. In this case, I don't know of another choice you, you could make here. Uh, there's an actual metric in this case, that's the natural ontology, I think, for a Bohm inversion. And then this is the natural dynamics uh, in this case. So, so I don't, don't see any other possibilities uh, here that would make sense. Yeah. Ah, the foliation dependence. So, so in this case, um, in this case of mini superspace models, this was as covariant as, as it could be because it was time parameterization invariant. So that's the only part of the diffeomorphism transformation that remains. But in a general case, yeah, you have to. The only way at the moment how we know how to do a Bohmian theory is to introduce a preferred foliation, or in other words, a preferred lapse function, okay, which brings you from one leaf to to the other. Um, well, I'd, for now we just know it, we have to assume one to get the dynamics going, okay? And the problem of uh, having a fully different morphism in pairing theory, well, that's again the non-locality, okay? And you have a similar problem in the context of special relativity. Uh, how do you combine Lorentz invariance with non-locality? These might not exclude each other, but it's hard to combine the two. And that's true for any version of quantum mechanics, even standard Copenhagen, okay? But in that context, in, special, in the context of special relativity, we have some way of, of having a Lorentz invariant uh, Bohmian theory, okay? It doesn't contain a preferred, well, it doesn't contain a, a, a foliation as an extra space-time structure, okay? I'm not sure if something similar could be done in this context or not. Uh, it's, it's an open question. Um, Thanks. 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 So maybe just going back on the things we talked about yesterday, the, uh, the obvious kind of suggestion for for a bogey mm -hmm. quantum technology, I think what Tim Kozlowski is working on is using the preferred the structure mm -hmm. of shape. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I think that would be mm -hmm. the thing that would make a lot of sense for it. Yeah, that's right. um, what I was going to ask, ask about is almost slightly different. So I was kind of in, intrigued that the way that you treat the Wheeler DeWitt theory, mm -hmm. how that, if you kind of work backwards, would relate to the interpretation of Hamilton Jacobi for Because mm -hmm. my intuition is that the way that you're, you're, you're treating the Wheeler DeWitt functional mm -hmm. uh, would mean that you'd also want to like, perhaps have an like, evolution of the principal function. Uh, what? So you're saying you'd, you'd want to. So it would be introducing an extra time derivative, saying the time derivative of psi is proportional to this Klein Gordon part. Uh. So you'd want to stick with the Hamilton Jacobi analysis as it was? Well, Hamilton Jacobi doesn't play a role here, right? Uh, so I mean for the, for the classical theory? Uh, for, for the classical limit here? or yeah, for yeah, yeah. In, the, in the classical limit of mm -hmm. your model, mm -hmm. how would you treat the Hamilton like treatment of it. Um, well, here in the, in the, the, the principal function would be indeed time independent here. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the, I think, it doesn't maybe answer your question, but having no time here in the wave function is actually kind of a virtue yeah, sure. rather than a disadvantage because if you say that like the basic ontology is this metric or non against ontology, the basic ontology is these particles, so I'm just, my, my kind of confusion is really that how this fits with direct quantization and kind of uh, this this is just ordinary direct quantization sure, applied sure. to yeah. But you, I would, I would, I would expect how, how Bohm fits with direct quantization. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Exactly. But I would expect that the like the direct quantization of the original model should mm. lead to, shouldn't lead to a, a model of 
evolution that you have. So I just want to know what, what is it that you're doing differently to the Dirac organization? Uh, bone mechanics is purely an interpretational move. Mm -hmm. Why is it that uh, applying Dirac organization leads to this timeless picture when, when most of the deal that leads to an evolutionary picture? So, sorry, I don't understand. So the direct translation just tells you something how to go from the classical theory to the wave equation, right? Okay. Sure. And then this Bowman step is something additional. You could see it as one continuous line, but this is what the direct quantization gives you. That would be the. Maybe we should talk about the same. Might my question really be like, are we doing Bowman mechanics on the physical Hilbert space where you project it down from states? Um, like the, the sort of annihilated by the wave function. States are not annihilated by the wave function. States are not annihilated by the constraints. Right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, well, I would say this Bohmian program is in no way different than you would do a Bohmian theory actually for like Maxwell's theory, quantized Maxwell's theory, where you also have constraints like the Gauss constraint. These give you conditions on the states. Sure, but in, in, in that case, you project out the. Oh, no, you don't. You don't have to do that, right? Uh, and, and also in the Bohmian case, you don't have to go to the reduced space and electromagnetism. You could say I have a vector potential, an actual vector potential, with all the gauge degrees of freedom. It devolves under this wave equation. Okay, it's going to be gauge invariant and all that. You know. But, but you, you wouldn't go to reduced space space. So. Uh, you meant, could do that. I but, meant reduced, mm. reduced space. Oh. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Enrique. Uh, thank you. I, I don't know much about what we're doing, so it's interesting. Um, I, I actually wanted to follow up a little bit on, on Vincent's uh, questions, which were essentially mine as well. Um, so in the beginning, you talk about uh, this singular support, so this uh, singular mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. metric. Mm -hmm. So what kind of Singularity, are you, th are you thinking about a covariant meaning of singular metrics, a fourth space time covariant meaning, or are you thinking about the Well, it's, it's, it's a function on three metrics, right? So right. it's spatial metrics, so it's singularities and. Right, but then mm -hmm. what is the covariant meaning of, of such singularity? Mm -hmm. I mean, you could have a different foliation and that yeah. skirts or alters these things. It's, it's difficult to. Yeah, like in the context of ordinary quantum mechanics, I, I have no idea really. Uh, like if you had to just read the bit equation without the Bohm approach, what what if your morphism invariance and all that means? I, I don't know. Uh, right. Yeah. The, the issue that and in the Bohmian case, you could analyze that, right? Because you still have a metric and it gives you a Lorentzian metric by time evolution, and you could see uh, is this Lorentz invariance or not? Yeah. 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 It, it always goes in there, right? right. Yeah, and so you would see then explicitly, ah, okay, the diffeomorphism environment is violated because if I have my F Laurentian metric, if I do a diffeomorphism, right. then and I don't have a new solution anymore, so that would, it breaks. But these issues are always masked by many superspace, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is also something related to what I wanted to ask about you building the, the four metric with these clock variables. I can, I, I'm always, in the mini superspace example, I can see it. Mm -hmm. But if you want to have uh, outside of it, uh, I wanted to understand better if you can do it to build a, a four-dimensional space-time metric with using this matter field solution. I didn't know. I, I, I wouldn't do that, right? Uh, that would be something you can do in the end. So in, in the general case, full quantum gravity, in the Bowman case, I would have a preferred foliation, or a preferred lapse function, and I would have my three metric evolving Right. Along the leaves of the foliation. Mm -hmm. So this okay. is an extra structure that's put in. It's not in that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the, the time coordinates here, well, you could choose another time coordinate but as long as you leave the leaves invariant, yeah. right? And so that time would then be the same as in GR, right? And then constructing actual physical clocks, of course, you would have to do some work and look at matter, degrees of freedom. Right. And do you really need this extra structure if you can construct physical clocks from the just a wave function? Yeah, I think so. Because otherwise, if you don't have something like time before or some parameter that just, yeah, but just relational time, say, 
Just, the, just the, the one that you use for dot. The one that you use for, sorry? Just with the one that you use for taking the time derivative yeah. dots, mm -hmm. but uh, you could forget about this scaffolding and just try to build the clock and build space time, right? And you could do with a single Yeah, but where, where would change come about then from? So I have a problem with saying from the start, okay, phi is my clock, uh, mm -hmm. right? So how does it change? Does, does it change? I, I, I don't know. Well, you have just this parameter t, which is global. Oh, you, yeah, yeah, if you keep the parameter t. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. You keep the parameter yeah, t, yeah, but yeah, you okay. don't keep the, 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 the leads. You don't keep the scaffold in this mm -hmm, time. Mm -hmm. You just have the one parameter curve or curves of, of metric, mm -hmm. and you can try to use metric to yeah, maybe maybe uh, you, you would say that you remove the foliation somehow? Yeah. Well, that could be a, and that would be could be a way of making a diffeomorphism invariant, making letting the foliation determine be determined by the wave function. Yes. And maybe also with the from the matter itself, uh, the actual Bohmian matter. Uh, that's especially that's, that's implicit what's done in uh, special relativity. Oh. So move like that. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Okay, I'm Joshua. Um, yeah, thanks. So um, in, in non relativistic quantum mechanics, it's essential to the kind of effective collapse mechanism in Bohm, right? That you um, that you get this disjointness of the wave packets, and that the vehicle yeah. right picks out in effect yeah. one of yeah. the wave packets. Um, so, so really, I mean, the, the reason the choice of vehicle matters is because it is sort of compatible with the compatibility. So, 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 so sorry, can I, it would matter for what? Uh, because uh, because that, that's like a, a slightly okay, bad way sorry, of putting yeah, it, right? Yeah, yeah, that yeah. trajectory is picking out a branch because in the end, what we have access to is the actual Bohmian variables, right? Not the, not the wave function, not the branch it's selecting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but I guess, but, but I guess in, in like Bohm's original paper, right, um, the way in which you get the correlation between mm -hmm. the configuration of the environment, mm -hmm. right, the configuration of the system you're mm -hmm. measuring, so you actually have a mm -hmm. measurement, mm -hmm. is this disjointness condition between the different mm -hmm. parts mm -hmm. of the wave function. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm guessing, uh, I'm wondering, is there is there a similar condition on the quantum state in quantum gravity that ensures that these extra variables that you pick out, or that, that, that you postulate, sorry, um, will be compatible in some sense with with the branching structure. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not sure you n need a branching structure here from the start, right? So I can, even if there's, even if my wave function is very smeared out or something and don't have a branching structure, I can still say, uh, this is the history of the universe. And from what I see today, I can trace back then, according to my Bohmian model, what would have happened in the past. Uh, uh, and of course, but what you're describing is really when you do actual measurements and whether there's a good correlation between your measurement device and the stuff you're trying to measure, right? Yeah, correlation. And that, that doesn't come up yet here yet. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, but, but and also this branching structure, it's like Bohm in his paper. He used this branching structure to show, ah, look, I have the same results as quantum mechanics. If, if my wave function develops into this position, the Bohm in configuration is either going to display one or the other outcome, and so. Right. Okay. And you're saying you just don't need to do that in, in this context. You don't need that sort of mechanism involved here. Not not yet, because there's no measurements here involved yet. Um, if you want to model measurements, then in the end, yeah, this is going to be relevant. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Um, So uh, I just a quick comment, but which is about this uh, in loop cosmology, the state packet in this week. So probably what you mean is that the state packet in this week has been valid, but you can obviously choose states where you don't, the measurement of the state packet will be necessarily to be one to that. Right? So, so, so I didn't hear that. Oh, the so last so part. Uh, yeah, so, so, so the wave function has support on discrete values of A, right? Or on right. discrete values of yeah, the so volume. The yeah. so, but, but then in your booming approach, it, which I don't know much about the thank you for the talk, but uh, it seems that the wave, uh, the, the state factor can only have discrete values. Right. This is not true in the cosmology because the wave function being on discrete support doesn't mean that the measurement of the scale factor, which you cannot measure, but anything that is related to the scale factor will always be just discrete values. This is not the same thing, right? Oh, I, I didn't know. Yeah. 
So, so you have an operator for volume and that... Right, the, the so that operator is discrete item value doesn't mean that a measurement for this. So I would consider an expectation value of the operator that depends on the state, the state that you choose to take the expectation value in. And uh, if it's not one of the Jardin states, it doesn't have to give you a discrete. It doesn't have to throw in but, but measurements would give you discrete values, right? If the eigenvalues are discrete, then measurements. But, I, but I an expectation know. value doesn't have to. So, so yeah. I, I, I don't know what measurement would mean in this case in any way because you cannot measure the state. Me value. neither. But, yeah. but the point is the state factor, the, the expectation value of the state factor doesn't have to just be discrete. That's right. Yeah. But in your case, it seems that that's an assumption that you are. That's a result. But the expectation value would also not have to be discrete in this case. So. So th that's my question. Yeah. Because you said that in the Bowman approach that uh, the scale factor is only discrete or... Yeah, the, the, actual val the actual value of the scale factor is, can only take discrete values. Okay. But if you yeah. take an average, if you, okay. if you okay. consider an ensemble somehow, okay. of course you don't have to have these values. So. Okay. All right. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. say there's an actual value uh, for the scale factor and mm. uh, an actual phi field. Mm. Uh, and an actual uh, metric, really, too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but um, I mean, loop of cosmology already, of course, you know, there's a sense in which all these values are taken and they're actual as well. So do you mean that there's like a... But that, that would be the same? ...actual pairing or specific values of A, there's a particular value for phi? Or yeah, yeah, there's always particular values for A and phi. Right. The pairing is the... Yeah, okay. and they, these change over time. Yes. Right? It, it would be... Uh, so it's not, it's obviously not a fixed uh, uh, actual value of those. Uh, well, at each time there is a fixed, time time there's, a def there's a definite value, but it changes over yes. time, right? So, so the metric just changes. The same picture as you get in GR, basically, but with the difference that this metric now changes stochastically, mm -hmm. right? At certain random times, it might just suddenly change. But for the rest, it's the same ontology as in GR, really. A metric and an actual scalar field. Just the way they evolve is different, yeah. Thank you, that's my thought. Now, he, here's an idea about how to generalize this to uh, general Bovian loop of uh, gravity. Mm -hmm. um, one obvious sort of vehicle would be to say it has, you know, uh, like an actual geometry, it's really a specific spin network or spin mm -hmm. bone. Mm -hmm. That's the mm -hmm. actual universe. Mm -hmm. do, do, does that make sense? Or? So, so I'm not an expert on these things, but I, I thought that would exactly be the route to go. Uh, yeah, so right. if you see more explicitly how that can be done, uh, yeah, please tell me. Uh, okay. Or some other experts here. Uh, yeah. I'm afraid we're out of time. I see some, do see another hand or two, but I think we're already running late. So let's um, say thank you again, and we'll start again. And <laughs>